Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the IACS seminar for this week. My name's Daniel Weinstock. I work at IACS as the Assistant Director of Graduate Studies in Computational Science and Engineering. Um, for those of you who might not have been here before, I just want to tell you a little bit about our seminar series. Um, we hold these on Friday afternoons, um, somewhere between every week and every other week, um, and we invite people from academia and industry and uh, national labs uh, who are all working in various areas of applied computation defined uh, quite broadly. Um, and so we have some upcoming uh, seminars that I'll briefly tell you about next week. Um, we're taking a break, but then we'll be back on March 6th um, with a presentation by a group of Harvard students who over the Winter break um, went on a trip down to Chile to uh, collaborate with a group of students from the University of Chile on um, a project working on astronomical data. And so they're going to be telling you about uh, their findings. Um, and then the week after that, um, Alan Aspiraguzic from the Harvard Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology is going to be here talking about um, billions and billions of molecules using uh, molecular simulations to explore uh, chemical space. And then uh, later on in the semester, we're going to have Jeff Bilmis from the University of Washington, Bahindra Bajuri from Oak Ridge National Labs, and then Christian Rutter from OKCupid. Okay so as you can see, a wide variety of uh, things going on. Um, this week, we have um, a group of people from Quantopian. Um, who are here. Um, I looked up on their website. Crontopian describes itself as a crowdsourced hedge fund and a platform for building, testing, and executing uh, trading of algorithm, trading algorithms. Um, and so we have uh, Delaney, uh, sorry, Graziano, Granizo McKenzie. McKenzie, sorry, that's tricky. It's impossible. Um, <laughs> who's, uh, I think, going to be doing most of the talking, um, and Delaney, um, has a bachelor's degree in computer science from Princeton. That's correct. Um, and then uh, he has uh, some of his friends uh, from Quantopian here who are going to be available for answering questions afterwards, including uh, Rich Frank, who's the director of engineering at Quantopian. Um, and Rich has a bachelor's degree from Brandeis in computer science and mathematics. And then um, we also have brought along um, a Harvard alum, Andrew Campbell, who graduated last year with a degree in economics. So, Delaney. Absolutely. Thank you. And first of all, thank you to IICS for hosting us. These are really cool. And uh, we always learn more than you do from giving these speeches and talks. So. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, I'm also going to quickly introduce uh, a couple more people that are tagging along today from Quantopian just so that you know who's planted in the audience to ask the interesting questions. Uh, we have sitting next to Rich, we have uh, Joe and Abhijit, both engineers. And then over next to Andrew, we have Sam. She's also an engineer. And then back up in the back in the corner is Sung. He's also an engineer. So we're all engineers. Um, let's get started. Pull up my slides here. Can everybody hear me okay? Just a quick check. Cool. Awesome. So first off, you just got a slight introduction as to what we do. Um, so I won't go through this too much. But we're a platform where you can develop and execute trading strategies. So the first question is, what's a trading strategy? Um, I know that some of you may know this already. Some of you are going to have knowledge about finance. Um, I'm going to go over some finance basics first, just in case uh, you haven't seen some of these before, just so that I can get everybody caught up, so that when I go to present the body of the talk, I can just make sure everybody's following. Um, so algorithmic trading is trading on the stock market, but letting an algorithm make the decisions for you. Now, the principle behind this is, let's say you have an idea for some strategy, whether or not it's like always buy Apple or whatever you want to do, like it's generally better to have an algorithm do it for you if you can put that strategy into code because the algorithm isn't going to make mistakes. It's going to be able to make trades much faster. It's going to be able to respond to signals way faster than you can. And it's going to be able to use mathematical techniques and it's going to be way less prone to bias. We have we all have incredible personal biases that are going to affect our decision making when we're like, say, picking stocks. And we want to try to avoid that because it gives us more uh, statistical rigor when we're trading. 
So I'm just going to go over a couple key finance concepts. These are going to be pretty basic. Uh, the first is Quantopian currently offers trading on the U.S. equities market, and this is just like your vanilla stock trading that you've probably all seen, heard about. When you go and check like what the market's doing today, that's the U.S. equities market. That's just companies that are traded on the market. You can buy shares of a company. That's that's the that's the the normal kind of trading that you see. Um, I'll just say the definition of a position. When you buy a stock, you enter into a position on that stock. So you now hold a position. That's just slang that we use to refer to uh, these things so that we don't have to use a lot of words. Um, returns. Uh, returns are just if you have some strategy or just maybe just a single stock. The returns are just if you bought that stock at a certain time, how much money would you have made or lost at some future time? That's the returns on your investment. And risk ratios. Risk ratios are a variety of statistics that we can use to determine how well a, tr a strategy or algorithm is performing on the market. Um, this is useful because when you have a strategy, you want to be able to evaluate how good it is. And this is where risk ratios come in. So a couple more ideas. Um, I don't know who here has heard about uh, short selling stocks, but it's actually fairly important for um, algorithmic trading because when you have all this math computing, you know, like what amount of a stock you should buy, sometimes the math works out that it's better to buy a negative amount of stock, and that's okay because what you can do is you can what's called going short on a position, which means that you sell a stock before you actually own it. Don't ask me how this is done because this is like, Wall Street magic, but the general idea is that it's mathematically equivalent to holding the negative amount of a position. And when you hold a negative amount of stock, you make money when the value of that stock falls. So it's a way of betting against a stock. If you think a company is going to do poorly next quarter, you can short that stock. And if that company's price goes down, you will make money. Vice versa, you make money normally when you go long on a stock when the stock goes up. So these are just ways of being able to act out on different kinds of signals. Um, hedging. Hedging is super important. Uh, if you guys haven't heard about hedging before, um, I'm pretty sure all of you have you know, heard the phrase hedging your bets. Well, that's basically what this is saying here. We're saying we're going to make a bet that a stock is going to go up, let's say. But we also want to protect ourselves against global market movements. So like, let's say we look at um, 2008, where the entire market falls a large number of percentage points. Uh, in that case, if you're invested in a stock that's going to go up, if the entire market decides to tank, that stock's probably going to go down with the market, just, just on average. You're, you're, not, you're not special. You are not picking that one stock, which is going to break the, break the market trend. So a way of hedging your bet against this is to also short sell uh, an equal position on another stock that you expect to go down. Now, the nice thing about this case is that if the entire market goes down, uh, you will uh, make money on that short position and hopefully break even in the end. Because even though you lost money on the position you expected to go up, you'll make money on the position that went down. So it's a way of making your strategy more robust to market movements. So next one. This is uh, one of the risk ratios that's commonly used to evaluate algorithms or trading strategies in general. It's called the Sharpe ratio. Uh, the Sharpe ratio is... A way of thinking about it, it's, it's a measure of your returns adjusted for the risk that you take on when you're running that strategy. And it's a simple computation, which is, um, let's imagine that there's some instrument which is pretty darn safe to put your money into. Let's say like US Treasury bonds. The US is not going to go out of business anytime soon. Those are a pretty safe investment. So you say the return of the US Treasury bond is this. That's the safe return. The return of your strategy is this. So this is, and then this, this whole quantity is the amount of extra returns you're making by running your strategy compared to what you could have made by putting your money in a safe instrument. And then what you do is you divide it by the standard deviation of the returns of your strategy. So what you get is basically you're saying, how crazy is my strategy in terms of its returns? Is it going up a lot and then going down a lot and then going up a lot? That's not necessarily great. Because let's say you just got great returns. There's no indication you're going to keep getting those great returns if you have a high standard deviation. Uh, the next quarter, you could lose a ton of money. And we'd rather see consistent returns than um, returns with a high standard deviation. So another phrase that I'm going to use a lot, when I say the market, basically what I mean is 
this uh, security called the S&P 500. It, tra it trades as SPY on the NASDAQ. Uh, it's basically just the average price of 500 big companies. And it's a good proxy for the market. When the market goes up, that's what goes up. When the market goes down, that's what goes down. And so it's often used as a benchmark if you want to say how much extra money compared to putting everything in the S&P 500 could you have made with some strategy. Um, so keeping in mind those concepts, I'm going through this here. Um, if anybody has questions at any point, please ask them, because I'm, I'm kind of blowing through this pretty quickly, because I want to get to the interesting stuff. So alpha and beta. Um, Another good way of expressing your algorithm's returns is in terms of this alpha and beta relationship. I'm going to give a really fuzzy definition. There are very rigorous mathematical definitions of all these concepts. If you're interested, I advise you look at them. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of give the, intuit the intuition behind these definitions. So here, uh, the idea here is that beta is a risk coefficient. So if you have a strategy that follows what the market's doing, but just blows it up, amplifies it. So like when the market does well, your strategy does really well. When the market does poorly, your strategy does really poorly. That would result in you having a high beta. That's not good because it means that you're really dependent on how the market's doing. And you want to be able to make a consistent amount of money whether or not the market's doing well, basically. You don't want to be dependent on the movement of the S&P 500. Um, so the alpha is this other part of your profits, which is not related to the market. And you want to increase your alpha. Oftentimes, you'll hear quants, traders, they're talking about finding alpha. That means they want to figure out algorithms that are going to increase the alpha of their returns. Um, because alpha being independent of the market means you're making money no matter what. So that's really what you want to go for. Uh, so market neutral is kind of the gold standard of a trading strategy because it means you're completely independent of the market. Uh, and you want to try to make your strategies as market neutral as possible in general. Um, for the same reason I just said, uh, you just want to get that beta as low as possible. And when I mentioned hedging, that's a way of doing this because when you enter into a hedged position, it's a way of lowering the dependency of your returns on the market and bringing that beta down. OK. A couple more concepts. So I said that Quantopian is a platform for developing and executing strategies. But in the process of developing, you need to evaluate your strategies to determine whether or not they're good. And one way of evaluating your strategy is to put money in your strategy and run it against the market and see if you lose money. That's not a very good way to do that. Um, a better way is to run your strategy against historical markets and basically pretend that you're at that time and you don't know about the future. So you remove look ahead bias and make sure that your algorithm does well um, when you're running at like random historical periods rather than just recent periods. That's a way of making sure that your algorithm is robust to different market conditions. Um, and this is really just uh, training a model. For all of you that have statistics experience, this is just the training section of your model. And for again, for all of you with statistics experience, you always want to have a rigorous training testing component of your algorithm development. Because if you train your algorithm on the entire market, you really have no way of testing its performance. And you might overtrain your algorithm to do really well on the last 20 years, but then be detecting some signal that's going to be completely, completely anomalous and not really useful for going forward and making money in the future. So. With that in mind, Quantopian's main product is um, this whole system wherein you can get at all these components that you need to develop trading strategies without having to go work at a hedge fund. So what do we offer? We offer access to market data, a backtesting environment where you can backtest on this market data with, with strategies that you wrote in Python. Um, IPython research. Anybody, anybody here has used an IPython notebook before? OK, that's good, because we now have an in-browser IPython notebook with access to market data that we're rolling out. It's not public yet, um, but it will be soon. And that's going to allow you to do everything you'll be able to do in an IPython notebook, but with access to market data. It's a great way of testing your ideas, basically. Uh, and then finally, if you have a strategy that you like, you can live trade it against the market, and you can use real or fake money. So the idea would be you use the IPython research environment to test your ideas, 
And then once you have something that you think makes sense, you'd back test it a bunch against the market, make sure it, it's working. Uh, you can even do this from inside the IPython research environment if you want to. Uh, and then you would um, probably trade it live against the market with fake money for a little while, just to get some extra certainty before you would put real money in it if you wanted to. So that's, that's kind of the, the pipeline we offer. And uh, the rest of the talk, more or less, I'll be going over an example of what's called pairs trading and showing basically you know, how you can use that pipeline to develop a strategy. So I'll say quickly beforehand, um, some interesting things about Quantopian. Uh, when I uh, started at Quantopian last year, um, I had heard people say this, but I wasn't really convinced that they were going to, you know, their bark, their, their bark was the same as their bite. But it's really true that people are really enthusiastic about all these things at Quantopian, which is the point of Quantopian is to move this incredibly closed technology, which has previously only been available to a very few individuals within the hedge fund and Wall Street's environment, and just make it open. It's, it's in browser. You can log on right now and use this. And the advantage of this is like, if you have an idea for a trading strategy right now, there's pretty much no way to actually do anything with it because you need to go get data, you need to build a back testing engine to test it on the market, you need to figure out a way that you can talk to a broker to execute those trades. And so we, our, our passion is, um, our catchphrase here is democratizing finance and we say hacking Wall Street, the idea being that we're trying to really bring kind of the idea of open software um, to this community. And we actually have open sourced a large part of our code base. Our entire backtesting engine is open source. So you can actually go on GitHub and fork our backtesting engine and add capabilities to it if you want to do something special or anything like that. Uh, and then the last thing is IP protection. If you, you go on, yeah, sorry. So, so democratizing finance would involve the, uh, getting data, the same data that Big firms in Wall Street get. Can you get that data in your platform? Yeah, so we basically, we uh, offer up to a minute resolution live data and we offer equities pricing currently. In, in like the pipeline of products that we're trying to, you know, at some point get to, we're looking at expanding to futures and options markets, so being able to stream in data for those as well. We don't currently support that, but it's on our, it's on our to-do list. Um, but yeah, if you, if you want, uh, we don't currently offer like second level data, but down to a minute resolution, we'll give you the same data that the, uh, the hedge funds are seeing when they look at the market. And you have a sense of uh, the difference between having access to the second to second data and the minute. It really depends on what type of strategies you're using. Um, and uh, I'd love to talk to you more after the talk about this if you have more questions, but yeah, for now I'm just gonna quickly say, when you, uh, when you make an algorithm on Quantopian, uh, you retain all of the IP of that algorithm. We don't take any cut of profits or like the idea of the algorithm. We won't even look at your algorithm. There's a strict policy against doing that. Uh, so like you're, you're completely protected and uh, I think that's a big difference from kind of the, the current paradigms within the finance community in terms of privacy and who gets to own what. So um, first things first, I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna show you the website. Um, and hopefully the internet doesn't die. But so the first thing you see when you log into the website is going to be the community page. So here I am in my account. Um, and uh, the community page is a really strong way that you can interact with other users of the site and people discuss ideas and uh, throw around trading strategies. And something that um, you'll notice is that we offer a lot of sharing services. So here, um, Sung actually recently shared one of these IPython notebooks that we're working on, which is loading right now. But um, you can see here somebody else, uh, actually, Sung again. OK, so there's a preview graph from the notebook that's showing up. So it's like, if you're interested in what he's doing, you can go ahead and view the notebook through this link. Uh, similarly, you can share these back tests that you've run of the algorithm. So you can say, here's, here's an algorithm. Um, here's the source code that wrote, that like generated this, this back test, these returns. Uh, you can go ahead and look at the uh, risk metrics. And if you're interested and you wanna say, work on this algorithm, maybe try messing with it a little bit, see how it performs over different time periods, can clone it, 
Um, and then now it's in my account. I have a copy of the algorithm uh, from the forums, and I can just mess with it. Uh, I can start, uh, try running it on, uh, say, like a different time period or anything like that. So this is, we really want to like foster this communication that we see on the forums. But I will again say, um, anything you see on the forums is only public because people have shared it. So we're not like looking at anybody's accounts or anything like that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, show you this uh, pairs trading post that uh, was on the forums. Justin, who's uh, another person who works at Quantopian, posted this algorithm. And it's a textbook pairs trading algorithm from a book written by Ernie Chan, uh, who's a uh, quantitative trader and runs a hedge fund. Um, and he basically was saying, here's like uh, a textbook example of pairs trading, um, which I'll, I'll explain what pairs trading is in a minute. But this is kind of a, 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 nice, a nice way to learn, because you can go on the forums and you can say, hey, I want to learn about pairs trading. I'm going to look for posts that have pairs trading in them. And here's a post. And you can see what's going on in this algorithm. Um, so I guess a, a question that arises is like, this is a decent amount of code. And it's not necessarily doing obvious things, especially if you haven't, if you aren't familiar with our platform. So how do you go from having an idea for something that could make money to having an algorithm like this that you can actually run and, and test? So the answer to that is uh, the research notebook environment. So this is our research notebook environment. And you can see here I have a bunch of notebooks. Um, we're going to be working on this one today. So I tried this earlier. It's a little slow to load on, these, on this internet. But it, oh, there we go. OK, so what I want to talk about is, is researching a pairs trading strategy. Because a pairs trading strategy is really a, kind of a nice example of how an algorithmic strategy can do something that you couldn't. Uh, so what does that mean? So let's say that we have two securities two stocks um, that are from companies that are strongly economically linked. So what does that mean? Let's say that there are two companies within the same industry that make the same product. So if that product is in demand, they're probably both going to do well. If that product is not in demand, they're probably both going to do poorly. Um, or let's say two companies that are in the same supply chain. Uh, that might be like a battery company and Apple computers. because. For, the, for Apple computers to make computers, the battery company has to get a lot of orders. And then there's, a, there's an economic link between the two. You can expect some kind of movement that's correlated between the two instruments. Uh, so I'm going to construct a very artificial and clean example of what this might look like uh, in the notebook. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to model a fake uh, security. We're going to call it X. X is some fake stock of some fake company. And we're just going to model the returns. We're going to sample from a normal distribution, and we're going to take 100 days of return. So this is just a nice way to generate uh, a random walk. So there we go. There's our, there's our returns. We've cumulatively summed them to get the, um, to get the, the cumulative returns, which is really what we, what we care about. Uh, and this is the price of the security over 100 time units. Let's call them days. Uh, so let's now add another security, which is um, that, that other company that is economically linked to the first one. So we're saying in this example, um, X and Y have an underlying economic link, and we want to make them move in turn. So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to say we're going to take X, and we're going to shift the price of X up. And we're going to add some random noise. And that's going to be the price of y. The idea being that this is a way of modeling two series that tend to move together. Um, so we'll see what that looks like here. And that's what it looks like. This is pretty much the cleanest example of this that you're ever going to see, because this is a very laboratory generated uh, artificial uh, example. But I'm doing this just so that it's very clear what's going on. So. The next thing I'm going to define is co-integration. Co-integration is what I've just been talking about, but it's the statistical term for it. So let's say that we want to detect securities that move like this, and we want to look for correlated securities. That's actually not enough. Uh, because with correlated securities, uh, you might have two things that move together, 
but one that moves much faster. So those would be correlated, but then you might get a situation where you just like, they just diverge. And that's not very useful for this strategy. Um, so what we want is a stronger form of correlation called cointegration. Cointegration is when the difference between the two series is normally distributed. Um, namely that there is a mean difference between the two and then there's some variance around that mean. So uh, basically what this means is that if you look at them and they're further apart, you can expect that they will revert to that mean at some point in the future and vice versa when they're close together you can expect that they will revert away to that mean. Uh, so pairs trading is really a mean reversion trading strategy where the signal that you're mean reverting on is the difference between two securities. So again, we'll go back to that hedged position. Uh, in this case, um, what you can do is you can hedge yourself by buying, uh, going long on one security and going short on the other security. And this leads to like the trick of pairs trading, which is, and I'm, I made a, a slide here where I kind of pre-compiled this. Um, so let's say that you're looking at these two securities and you notice that they're far apart using this, uh, you know, just comparing them. Um, so here there's a large difference and because it's larger than average, we expect the difference to shrink in the near future. So what we can do is we can say we're going to long this bottom one and we're going to short the top one. Why are we doing this? Because if the distance shrinks, then the bottom one on expectation will come up and the top one on expectation will go down. So we're betting that the top one will fall. We're going to short it. We're betting that the long one will go up. We're going to long it. So in this case, what happens? Well, a little while later, sure enough, the distance shrinks again. Um, interestingly, uh, we longed the bottom and it went down, but that's okay. And this is what I'm saying about being, being robust to market movements. In this case, maybe these securities are moving with the market and the market went down here. Um, it's fine, you're still gonna make money because that short of the top is gonna to make you so much more money on this spread than the long of the bottom lost on this spread that you're, you're, you're gonna make money. So this is an example of how you can hedge yourself across this pair of securities to guarantee, or not guarantee, but make it very statistically likely that you will make money. So let's go back to the notebook. Um, so knowing this now, the next question is, well, how do you find actual pairs of companies, securities that behave like this? Because you, know, you want to write a trading strategy uh, that, that works like this. So you say, okay, um, I'm gonna use this uh, co-integration test. It's from uh, Stats Tools, which is a, a Python library. Uh, there are a couple different ways of testing for co-integration. I'm just gonna use this built-in one uh, it's going to work basically as well as any of the others. So as a sanity check, let's just check whether these two uh, securities are co-integrated because like, we specifically designed them to be co-integrated, so I would hope they are co-integrated. And we'll do the check here, and sure enough, it's a ludicrously low p-value. Again, this is like the nicest co-integrated pairs you will ever see. It is a p-value of 10 to the negative 15th. You will never see anything like this in real life. So. I wrote this method. Uh, what this method does, and you don't have to worry too much about the details here, but this method uh, just takes uh, a bunch of different securities and it loops through them and it looks at all the pairs and it checks, it does this co-integration test. It says, um, are any of these securities co-integrated? Uh, now, there's a little bit of a danger here. Uh, for those of you, again, who have a statistics background, um, you'll know what I'm saying when I say that this falls prey to uh, multiple comparison bias. Um, the problem is that if you just look at the entire market, and or let's say you look at 100 securities, you do 10,000 comparisons, or not 10,000, but you know a large number of comparisons, um, you, uh, you end up with a lot of p-values, and there's 
it's likely that one of those p-values is going to be significant. So in general, you don't want to um, just look at random securities and hope that you'll find co-integrated pairs. In general, what you want to do is look at a set of securities that you suspect between them might have some, some co-integration behavior, and then use this as a way of verifying your, your hypothesis rather than looking for a random hypothesis in, in the junk. It's just a kind of a, a data, data science principle here. Um, so yeah, so keeping in that mindset, I just made a, a basket of alternative energy um, and uh, tech stocks. I added these tech stocks just because I was curious. Uh, it really, the, the only basket that I'm concerned about is, is these ones. These are just uh, symbols for, um, that I got off a website for uh, solar companies. Uh, if you're curious, you can actually go and look at the underlying companies behind this, but I'm just going to be mainly looking at the symbols today. Um, so these are all solar companies, and given that they're making basically the same product, we might expect to find some co-integration behavior uh, between some pair here. So, And then we'll also add this Apple and Microsoft for fun. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get the data. Um, this is our get pricing function, which gives you access to the market data within the notebook. So now this securities panel variable uh, has all the um, data for those different securities over time. Um, and then this is, just, uh, this is just a little bit of a Python magic just to make the security symbol show up nicely as strings in the graphs. So I do this test. I'm going to run my co-integration test on all pairs here. And I'm going to generate this heat map of p-values. So you can see here, uh, lighter is better. It looks like we actually have one uh, that uh, is a pair that is co-integrated, um, which is no surprise because I prepared this ahead of time. So you can see here, it's printing out um, a couple pairs. The thing I actually found was interesting was that, so initially I'd done this presentation uh, just using this ABGB and FSLR uh, symbols. Those were two solar companies, which turned out to be co-integrated. Um, I added Apple just because I, was, I wanted to see what it would look like if this heat map got bigger. And it turns out that Apple is co-integrated with CSUN. I have no idea why. I, this, is, this is an example of um, why you want to go back and check that underlying economic link. Maybe there is one. Uh, or maybe it's just a, a fluke in the data and you're, you're, you're overtraining in here. So, but that said, uh, this is really kind of showing off um, the capabilities of the IPython notebook. Uh, I say this having, you know, Quantopian did not make the IPython notebook, but it's really nice. Like, for instance, let's say I only want to look at uh, p-values which are under uh, 0.1. I can do that. So these are the only ones under 0.1. It's just a really nice way of being able to mess with your data and get your hands dirty and, and do stuff quickly that's going to give you feedback versus you know, running a script that might take a little while to get back to you, and then you have some black box results. So um, we're going to continue with this uh, ABGB FSLR pair. So let's look at the prices. Um, if you are actually developing a strategy on this, I would highly recommend uh, going and looking at the underlying economic link between the two. Just figure out why they might be co-integrated. Uh, I'm not going to do this now in the interest of time. We're going to pretend that there is a known economic link between these two companies. Uh, but you can see here, the prices actually follow a nice uh, co-integrated movement over 2014. You've got uh, a general kind of distance that they keep between them, and you've got some deviation of that distance, mainly coming from the FSLR stock. So I think these are probably good candidates um, to use for pairs trading. So the next step is what signal do you actually want to trade on? And the answer is a z-score. Um, but how do we get a z-score? Well, we're going to use some moving averages. Uh, for those of you who haven't used moving averages before, uh, it's just a way of, uh, it's just a signal processing technique where you, you take the average of the last n data points and it's a way of cleaning up the data. It's like a poor man's Kalman filter. Uh, if you're actually using something that you wanted to put money in, um, I'd recommend using more statistically robust techniques like a Kalman filter. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, it's basically a rich man's moving average, which I'll explain in a second. But, um, so let's go through here. 
Uh, so we're going to, basically we're going to get the, the five day moving average, which is going to be our proxy for the current difference. And we're going to get the six, uh, the, sorry, the 30 day, or I, oh, I made a mistake here. This should be 60. But it's IPython notebooks, so we can pretend the mistake never happened. Um, so this is a graph of, you can see here, the um, green is, the red is the actual difference, which is kind of a crazy signal going all over the place. Uh, the green is the five-day moving average, which is what we're using as a proxy for the actual distance. It just smooths it out a little bit. It makes it less vulnerable to crazy swings. Um, but it still follows this pretty closely. And then the blue is our 60-day moving average. We're using this as the proxy for the true mean difference. Um, the reason that we are looking at the last 60 days is because the mean, the true mean may drift over time. The, the securities may kind of start to drift further apart or close together, and we want to be robust to that. So we're, for the purposes of comparison, we're saying that the mean over the last 60 days is the mean difference between the two securities. So um, the last two things we need are the standard deviation and the z-score. Um, so we get the standard deviation in the same way. We take a standard deviation the last 60 days, just like we did for the mean. And to get the z-score, we're taking the, our proxy for the current difference minus the average difference over the standard deviation. So just number of standard deviations away from the mean you are, it's just a z-score. Um, so that's what the z-score looks like. It turns out that um, I'm subtracting here, you'll notice I'm subtracting FSLR from ABGB, but FSLR is more expensive. So the z-score is, is it, it's fine from a signal processing standpoint. That's totally fine. Your algorithm is going to work. But for the sake of presentation, I'm actually going to take the negative of the z-score in, in the next slide just to make it more sensible. sensible. And I'm also going to scale down the price so that we can display these on the same graph. Uh, so you can see here, this is the z-score, which is our trading signal, um, which we hope to get alpha out of. Uh, and these are the prices of the two securities. So you can see, um, basically, the feedback that the algorithm's getting. This is, this is what the algorithm knows, and this is the actual underlying price of the two securities. And it's just a nice kind of double-check way. Everything's working. Make sure there's nothing that looks crazy in here. You know, you didn't make a mistake or there's no bug in your, in your code. So... At this point, we're pretty certain that we want to do, or at least try out, a uh, pairs trading strategy on these two securities. So what, how do we do that? Well, we're going to backtest. So um, I wrote a super simple algorithm for the case of demonstration that does pairs trading on these two securities. Um, I would never put my money into something like this because it's like the result of five minutes of coding. But again, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to show you the performance using that more complicated textbook algorithm from Ernie Chan that I had in the forums earlier. So uh, let's just go through this real quick and see what it does. Um, you can see here, I'm just defining those two stocks to be the symbols that we were discussing. I am uh, saying that our z-score -score threshold is going to be 1. And I, these are just some flags for whether or not we're longing the top and shorting the bottom that the uh, program uses to uh, keep track of where, what it's doing. So this is handle data. This is called every bar. And we're running this algorithm at a daily frequency. So every day, we're going to look at the um, z-score of the difference, see if, it's, you know, if the two securities are particularly far apart or particularly close on that day. So how we're going to do that is every day we're going to take the um, price over the last 60 days and the price over the last uh, five days. And then we're going to get the mean price over the last 60 days. And we're going to get the standard deviation over the last, sorry, 60 days. And the mean price over the last five days. These are just our moving averages, which we generated in the notebook. But now we're generating them live in the algorithm. And then we're going to compute that z-score that we computed before. That's going to be the signal that the algorithm is actually going to look for when entering or leaving these positions. So now this is the actual trading logic. Um, so on Quantopian, we have these APIs that allow you to just like type order into your algorithm 
And then if you're running in a simulation, it will send the order to the simulation broker, which will like pretend to be the market and be like, yes, I've accepted your order and you know, here's the future price of the securities and everything. Um, in, if you're running it with real money, this would actually send a signal to a real life broker, which would then execute your trade. So what you're doing here is, um, and can everybody see this okay? Because we have another uh, format here. Is, is this better or worse? Better, better, okay, cool. Um, so what this is doing is it's saying we're gonna order a target percentage, which is gonna be 50 of the stock one, the security one. Um, and what that means is we're longing the top, we're going long, we're ordering a positive amount. And we're gonna do the same thing, but negative, we're gonna take the other 50% of our money and we're gonna put it into the bottom one. We're gonna go short, sorry, yeah, we're, we're gonna go short, uh, sorry. I, I uh, messed that up. We're going to go short on the top, and we're going to go long on the bottom. So we're going entering a negative position for the security that is currently high, and we're entering a long position on the security that is currently low. So we're betting that these are going to, at some point, converge back, and we'll make money. And then this is just the opposite. We're going to uh, do the opposite position if they're particularly close together. We're going to long the top, and we're going to short the bottom. So. And then here, this is just, I'm printing the, the prices and the z-score on the screen just to get myself some feedback. So you can see here, um, I just ran it over this time period, uh, 2014, which is the period we were looking at. Um, and whereas the algorithm doesn't do particularly great, there's this weird dip at the start, it, actually, it, makes, it makes money significantly in excess of the market, which means that there is a signal here. Um, and one way of checking that is you can say, well, let's look at these risk ratios that we're displaying. Um, and so we have a positive alpha, that's good. It means that we have a component of our profits which is not related to market movement. And we have a, a beta that is significantly lower than our alpha, which is good. We want to make that beta as low as possible. Um, the sharp ratio is not great. Um, we could definitely improve on that. Uh, but Overall, if you ran this strategy in 2014, you might have you know, a little bit of a heart attack somewhere in February, but like at the end of the year, you'd come away with nearly 30% returns on your money, which is not bad. Again, not something I would put my money into, but it's a start. This is the idea here is that you do your back test, and then you see how it goes, and then you say, what's that weird thing at the start? Go back to the notebook, figure out what's going on there, improve your strategy, make it more robust to things like that, and then continue that development cycle. Um, so the next step is I just wanted to show you guys uh, what happens if we take this algorithm that's on the forums, the uh, textbook pairs trading algorithm, and literally all I did is I cloned it and uh, changed the two securities that it trades on to be uh, ABGB and FSLR. And so this, this one's going to be a significantly better algorithm because it uses things like Kalman filters. Um, you can see here, this one doesn't fall prey to that weird drop at the start. Why it doesn't fall prey, I have no idea, but it doesn't. And uh, the overall uh, returns are much more consistent uh, and actually leave you with uh, a, much, a, much better, uh, a much better figure. I think I might have accidentally reported the drawdown as the returns on the last one. So, yeah, the last one is it's actually 40% returns, um, and this one gets up close to 60. The sharp ratio is much better because it's consistent returns. It's not, not as crazy as that first one. Um, beta is actually lower, closer to zero, and alpha is higher. So, like, in all ways, this is a better algorithm than that simple one. But, again, this is the result of a long development period, and this is kind of the goal that you're working towards rather than the thing that you start with. So that's largely the pipeline. Um, I'm just gonna kind of make some closing remarks here on what you can do with this, which is uh, we're actually uh, trying to develop the world's first crowdsourced hedge fund. Now what does that mean? That means that previously all hedge funds um, tended to be run based on like a small group of individuals who were good at one thing or knew each other for some reason and then built a hedge fund um, that managed people's money and worked for a while. 
the issue with hedge funds is let's say that you're going to put your money into a hedge fund, right? And you look at a hedge fund, and this hedge fund is doing great. This hedge fund has 30% returns for the last six years. You ask a statistician about this, and they'll tell you about survivability bias, which is the only hedge funds around today are the hedge funds that didn't go out of business last year because they made negative 50%. So one thing that's very difficult within the hedge fund market is the ability to know whether you know, the hedge fund that you're looking at today is actually consistently getting good performance for real reasons or just happens to be the one that made the right bets on the market and lucked out, whereas three other hedge funds died. So our plan is we're going to make a hedge fund where anybody can be a manager. Anybody's algorithm can manage money. Um, and through that method, uh, basically get way better um, diversification in our portfolio, be able to select from a lot of different strategies, um, and be able to do a lot of statistically rigorous filtering on the returns of strategies because we have the daily returns. Again, we're not looking at your algorithms, but we can look at how much money it made every day. Um, and from that, we can look at the, the risk ratios. So one of the ways that we're feeding into this is we currently have a contest running. And I'm going to go check out the leaderboard in that. So this is uh, a contest which we launched last month. And um, how this works is people who have algorithms that they think are good, or even if you don't think they're good, you can still submit it. But if you have an algorithm that you want to enter into the contest, you can enter that algorithm into the contest. It's pretty easy. Uh, you just click a couple buttons. And then we, start, we take that algorithm. Um, clone it at the time you entered in the contest, and then start running it against uh, real money on the market, not real money, but fake money on the real market, and we back test it against historical time periods. Um, and from this, so you can see here we can look at the person who's doing best currently, we generate like these, these, uh, these, this combined score, which is uh, partly your current performance on the market over the last month, and then partly all these back tests that we do on, on random historical market periods. Um, this guy is doing suspiciously well on the market this month, which means that, again, this is too few data points. There have only been like 20 trading days this month. Um, I expect this number to go down closer to his backtest performance, which is still pretty good. His backtest performance is, um, is pretty good. He's got a pretty good sharp ratio there, um, which means that he's achieving this fairly consistently. He's not going crazy all over the place. Uh, so the idea here is let's say you have an idea for an algorithm, um, but you don't have you know, a million dollars lying around that you can run your algorithm on and make money. You can submit your algorithm to the contest, and every month we're going to pick a winner, and that winner will be given, the, the algorithm will be given $100,000 to manage. So we'll run that algorithm against $100,000, and you keep all the profits. We take nothing. The idea is this, is this is a program where we can start to select this portfolio of algorithms um, that do well and vet the algorithms when they're trading real money on the market and start establishing candidates for the crowdsourced hedge fund. Um, and if at a certain point your algorithm is offered a position within our crowdsourced hedge fund, you will still be keeping a share of the profits. It won't be 100%, but you know, you'll be keeping a share of the profits that's run against a much larger sum of money than $100,000. So it will. It's, it's, a, it's a sizable chump. So um, the idea here, again, is we're trying to democratize finance. We're trying to give people who have good ideas an ability to actually do something with those ideas versus right now you basically just have to go work at a hedge fund. That's your other option. So this is basically a way that you could run a hedge fund from your basement if you wanted to. If you had a good algorithm and, and you put it through the the contest and it does well and it gets selected, this is, you are literally now a hedge fund manager running money with an algorithm in the market. Um, so I think that's most of what I had to say. Um, oh, last note, uh, we're hiring engineers. So uh, if any of you are engineers and interested in working for Quantopian at some point in the future, just uh, come and talk to any of the Quantopian people, and uh, we can tell you what the steps are for that. Um, I, I, I asked permission to do a hiring, a hiring uh, plug before. So, um, OK, I will uh, now open it up for questions. Yes? 
How does the actual purchase work? Do you have a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, for example? Yeah, so uh, we uh, currently support interactive brokers. Um, and interactive brokers offers, uh, basically we, we communicate with interactive brokers and you would make an account in interactive brokers, put money into that account, and then you would tie your algorithm to that interactive broker's account. And then whenever you said order in your algorithm, it would send that order to interactive brokers and then interactive brokers would actually fulfill the order for you. Um, so again, we're not, we're not like actually holding your money in this case. It, we're just kind of tying our, your algorithm to your broker. Yeah. Is there something to be said about intellectual property protection? Say if someone submits an algorithm that's really good and what keeps, what would keep you from just, you know, taking, you know, owning it and making a lot of money and not letting other people. So I think I will quote as well as I can our CEO, John Fawcett, on this one. Um, and Rich, if you want to add something to this afterwards, be my guest. Uh, but John Fawcett, as John Fawcett says, we have set up this, like, the system to the best of our means such that our interests are aligned with your interests. And our interests are not to take your algorithm and own it for ourselves. For one thing, that's not what we want to do, and there's an element of trust in that. But for another thing, if we ever did that, that would be basically the end, the end of us as a company. Like Nobody else would ever want to use us again. Um, so it's, it's basically protected as, as best we can in the structure of how we do business with our users. But if, if you want to add something to that. I agree with everything you said. Um, one of the challenges has been to decide what is a good business model for the company. And some of the options have been to, uh, like, we could charge people for the service that we're doing, whereas right now it's free. And we decided to align ourselves with the uh, authors of the algorithms and uh, give them the benefit of, of the money that people will invest, as opposed to taking money from people for writing. Um, but yeah, it comes down to trust, and it comes down to uh, us aligning ourselves well with, with uh, the interests of our users. Uh, let's just go this direction. So yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, to be related to that, the point token will not do proprietary trading on itself, right? It's just yeah, it's so that that by itself will probably give a little bit of isolation, any isolation to the chain. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. So if you're not going to steal our algorithms and you're not going to take our money, okay. what is the business model? So the business model is when we have this crowdsourced hedge fund, we're going to be taking outside investments, just like a regular hedge fund would, from people who want to invest money in the fund. And then when we have the portfolio of algorithms uh, from the users running against that money, we will be taking a cut of the profits. So it'll be a profit sharing between us and the user who wrote that algorithm when we're running it against the investor's money. And I have yeah. a big question. OK, so perfect. <laughs> yes? Uh, how sophisticated is your uh, backtesting uh, platform? So is this this price touch, price fill model, or is this probabilistic price fill model? Do you model the book depth and uh, actual market situations? So uh, I'm actually not an expert on that part of the system. Uh, maybe. Um, Rich might answer that better. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I can answer all of your questions. I uh, just but, a question. Right, well, there are, <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> um, uh, so we were modeling, there are a number of models that you can actually um, customize yourself. Um, we support uh, a slippage model where you can model like your impact on the market, things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to build it out and also things that we're missing. The whole backtesting portion is all in Python and is open source on GitHub. And so uh, anything that's missing, please add to it and like it'll help everyone. And um, yeah, that as well as I can answer that. Who is next? Does anybody have questions? Questions pending? Yes. So for interactive bro brokers, do you need uh, accredited, accredited investor status for that? No, right? I, I, yeah, I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, it's, ju it's just a, it's a personal trading account, and the trades are just happen to be coming from your algorithm. There's no like legal uh, extra protection versus you like making a Fidelity or an IB account and just going ahead and trading yourself. 
Anybody else? Yes. What's the timeline for when you imagine being able to launch the crowdsourced hedge fund? Uh, again, I might, I don't know. It's, I think we're working on it as fast as we can. Obviously, this, this, this contest is taking place now and it's going to keep going over the year. Um, I think that it probably just depends on when we have a portfolio of algorithms that we feel is diverse enough that we can then go to investors and, and offer, offer, like, say, hey, this is, this is a really good statistically rigorous portfolio of algorithms that we can actually swap out at any time. So. And part of that is not just finding the algorithms, but providing the uh, more data and features to like allow users to create those algorithms. So there's a lot of engineering work and hiring and things to do. Uh, left. So I, I don't have numbers, but there's a lot of work to be done. We're hiring, in case I didn't. <laughs> Yes. So a little bit confused here because you did you, you showed for example a pair testing algorithm and just two securities. Yes. If there are n securities, there are n choose way n choose two ways of actually putting these things together. So Absolutely. there's an in, potentially infinite go for combination of I, things. In a, in, a real, which, in a real pairs trading strategy, you'd probably want to have like thirty or forty pairs that you were looking for because then at any given time, one of them is probably going to be close or far, and you can always be making some trade. No, no, I, I understand yeah. that. But I think if at the point that you're actually choosing algorithms. Mm -hmm. Suppose I come up with a pair with you know with with, with the pairs algorithm on only two companies and it really backtests very well. Mm -hmm. What well, I means how do you choose those kind of things? Because if you have you know one thousand different companies that you could possibly pair test and this this is a big combinatorial explosion of possibilities to choose. And so I was kind of right. uh, trying to understand think, your process. That's why I think you so to that part of it I would say is actually more of an art than a science and. Um, that's why you want to start with companies that have an economic link. So one, one thing you could do is you could look within a certain field of companies and uh, start like filtering down the companies based on the products they make um, and try to look for companies that make similar products. And you could even do this partially algorithmically by getting data sets of, um, we actually offer corporate fundamentals data now, so I'm not sure if you could use that to try to look for companies that might be similar economically, but at the very least, you could you know do Google searches for like product keywords and, and start like developing these lists of companies that you might want to sample from. Yes. So, which markets are you uh, um, are you targeting with your competitions? Yeah. Is there like a set of markets or set of uh, securities or the index funds? So, Quantopian gives you access to trade on um, well, Quantopian gives you data for the U.S. equities markets, uh, which means you can do any stock that's traded um, on the NASDAQ, basically. Uh, and again, we're, we're looking to expand that. That's part of our... I mean, how do you evaluate, you evaluate different algorithms on a particular set of stocks, right? I mean, how do you decide on... Do you let the competitors know, okay, this is the particular set of stocks we're going to use to evaluate your approach? Oh, in terms of, like, benchmarking for... Yeah, sure. So. Um, I think you just want to use your best current alternative. So uh, let's say that you have no good algorithm right now, then you're going to kind of, the default is to go for the American U.S. equities market through the S&P 500 and just say like that's kind of the, that's the nice safe return, usually doesn't go down uh, unless there's a big recession, and that's what we're going to compare our algorithm to. But then you can start using different benchmarks in the future if you want. I mean, you can set different benchmarks in our back tester. Uh, it's, it's very flexible. It's just, again, it's up to you to determine what you want to compare your new algorithm to. So, so transaction costs, you didn't talk about them, perhaps because you were using $100,000. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so pairs trading is actually a strategy that is still feasible with $10,000. Um, transaction cost in IB uh, is actually only $1 per trade. So $1 per trade. So, so it's actually... With, with your broker. Uh, with the, yeah, yeah, with interactive brokers. So uh, it's actually pretty feasible to do reasonably high frequency trading strategies compared to like Fidelity, which is like eight. Um, but obviously that's something that we'd like to, to, to reduce as much as possible, so. Okay, I think we'll leave it off there, and uh, Delaney and, and Raymond, these guys will be around afterwards if you have further questions, but thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, everybody.